All right, here we are dealing with divorce, difficult issues, biblical answers. This is lesson number 13, the last in this particular series. And the title of this one is Love and Marriage. Love and Marriage. Isn't it ironic that in this day of you know, Oprah and Dr. Phil, in a time where there are all kinds of marriage prep seminars and countless books on how to be happily married, that the rate of divorce continues to hover around 40 to 50 percent. Isn't it amazing that people wait longer to be married? Uh, you know, uh, the, the age uh, where a woman has a child is much higher now than it used to be. So people wait longer to be married, longer to have children, prepare for it socially for a longer amount of time, even experiment with live-in partners uh, more than ever before, and yet the counseling offices can't keep up with the unhappy marriage partners. It's still a problem. And yet we continue to marry. Thankfully, people haven't given up on marriage as an institution. As of uh, 2015, approximately 2.3 million people, uh, 2.3 million uh, weddings actually, uh, in America, the latest stats for 2015. And we continue to marry because we believe that it is within marriage that the greatest potential for happiness and fulfillment is found. So people keep believing in marriage and uh, even if they, are, they get married older and wait longer and get ready for it with, you know, with more time, the divorce rate continues to, to be high. So this lesson here in our series is entitled Love and Marriage because I want to focus on the key ingredient that makes a marriage wildly successful and that is the element of love. And to finish out our series, of course, we've been talking about divorce and you know, the problems that stem from divorce and how we can recover and so on and so forth. So I want to finish our series on a, on a, on a, positive, on a positive note. Now there are a lot of ideas about what love really is and what love feels like. I mean, you know, most of the pop music uh, and pop songs uh, are about how love feels when you get it, when you lose it, when you have it. But if you want to succeed in marriage, you have to cultivate a certain kind of love. And this is the type of love that I want to uh, describe to you uh, today. Now, I, I never met a couple who wanted their love to last only a little while, right? You ever see people getting married and they're pledging their love to each other and they say, I pledge my love to you for the next three months. You know, no, nobody thinks like that. We, we want to love for an entire lifetime, right? I want to be able to love my marriage partner all my life and I want to be loved by my marriage partner for a lifetime. That's why I enter into that commitment. Now some people marry, they stay faithful to one another, but they stop loving each other. And you know, it's a, it's a pretty difficult thing to be married to somebody you don't love anymore. You know, my, my mother used to say that love is like a flame. It burns brightly so long as it's fed. And I agree with this idea, but would add that it also depends on the kind of love that you are feeding in your marriage. Now when it comes to love, we have a lot of ideas concerning love's nature and application. Um, we say, for example, boy, I love football and I love pizza and I love my wife. Notice different things that we love, baseball, pizza, spouse, and yet we use exactly the same word to describe the emotion we have about sports or food or or our, our wives or husbands. The Greeks, on the other hand, and I mentioned the Greeks because the New Testament was written originally in the Greek language. So the Greeks had a very precise language. They, they had different words that described the different kinds of love experienced by people. So I want to explore that for a moment. First of all, the kind of love expressed by humans according to the Greek language. So you had the word eros. Eros in the Greek referred to sensual love, the gratification of the senses. 
And so the love of art and music, sex, physical activity like sport, love based on the idea that we love what will give us physical pleasure in some way, especially sex. Eros was the Greek god of love. For example, I love baseball. I eros baseball, I eros music, I eros sex, all things that give me a sense of physical pleasure. The correct word describing the correct emotion. Another word in the Greek, the word philios. The word philios was the word for brother and brotherly love. This word refers to a need for intimacy and sharing. It includes our cherished feelings for acquaintances or neighbors, or working for a common cause, politics for example, to the highest form of philios, which is friendship. It also refers to the love of humanity in general um, and expressed in the word philanthropy, right? A philanthropic enterprise is what? It's an enterprise that has as its goal serving humanity in some kind, finding uh, vaccines for a certain disease or helping you know, the poor in a certain country or digging wells uh, in, 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 in lands that need fresh water. All that was philanthropic work, not eros work, not, not the eros of humanity, but the philios of humanity. All right, so I love my buddies, my best buddy, I love him. That's not eros, that's philios. And I love to help the poor, that's philios. Another word in the Greek, the word storgos. Now the Greek word storgos was the Greek root word for the idea of the home or a house. It referred to the love that exists because of family relationships. Uh, it expresses the feelings between those who have a blood relationship. I love my mom. I don't eros my mom. I don't philios my mom. I storgos my mom, okay? Um, storgos, this word, is based on a common heritage or a social structure or a common experience. The love of country, for example. I love my mother, I love my kids, I love my family, I love my country, okay? So now we, uh, excuse me, we experience, I meant to say, we experience all of these types of love in some way within marriage. And all of these are a source of joy and pleasure within marriage. For example, I eros, my wife, yes, we have sexual love between us. And you know what, my wife and I were best buddies. I filios her as well and I storgos her and our children and our family. So we, you know, we, 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 find, um, uh, we find satisfaction um, by expressing all of these different kinds of love, you know, expressed by these various words here within, within marriage. Now these types of love, however, and here's the, here's the point I want to make with this, these types of love, however, are all based on things that are outside of ourselves. For example, sex is stimulated by our need for gratification by someone else. And friendship is based on things we share with someone else. And family is produced by adding another or, or you know, establishing something that's beyond uh, ourselves. Now, as good as these things are, they're not the source of love, they are merely the experience of love. Again, nothing negative about this, just trying to place this type of love in its proper context. Uh, so as I say, these are not in themselves what make love grow. They are the ways we express and the ways that we experience love. Eros, philios, storchos. Now, for the source of love, we must go to God because the Bible says that He is the source of love. John chapter, or first John rather, chapter four, verse 16. And so the source of love is not sex or family or friends. Um, the source of love is God. When we understand the nature of God's love, 
then we will know how to begin love and feed the love that keeps our relationships alive and wonderful. So this brings us to the kind of love expressed by God. So when the New Testament writers began to describe God's love for man in Christ, they introduced an obscure word that was rarely used in the Greek and in Greek literature, and that was the word agape, agape. This Greek word described you know, the doting kind of love that a father would have for an only child or a special child. It's a kind of a spoiled love, you know, the kind of love that a grandfather or grandmother has for their grandchildren. This word agape described in the Greek described that kind of love. And so the writers used this word because the nature and expression of God's love for man did not fit the categories defined by the usual words for love that had been used in the past. Eros, philios, storgos, you know, God's love for man, not sexual in nature, not, not friendship in nature, not home, not family in nature, not in that sense. So the challenge that they faced was to find a word that described the kind of love that had never been seen or experienced before. And that is God sending his only perfect son to die for those who hated and disobeyed him. And he did so in order to save these people. So this type of sacrificial love was not based on shared experiences. This type of sacrificial love was not based on physical pleasure or common heritage. It was a love that gave without condition and the word agape seemed to capture the spirit of the action in a way that these other words could not. This is why every time the word love is used in the New Testament, except for one occasion, it is used to translate the Greek word agape, agape. So the reason for this is that there are great differences between human love and agape love. For example, agape love is not stimulated by self-gratification or intimacy or beauty or shared interest. That's not what stimulates agape love. Agape love is produced by a response of obedience towards God. For example, he says, love your neighbor, and we do this as an act of obedience. Not, not because our neighbor is nice or our neighbor shares our skin color or our neighbor shares our interests. We can have you know, filios with our neighbor, you know, brotherly, we can have that. But when God says love your neighbor, he's not saying filios your neighbor, he's saying agape your neighbor. Our neighbor has nothing to do with our loving him. Our love for him is based on our obedience to God. Agape. Just like Jesus' death for us was not based on loveliness or our request, but rather on his response of obedience to the Father. Jesus loved, Jesus agape. He loved the Father and so he obeyed the Father until death. This is the essence of the idea of agape type love. Uh, another point. Agape love begins with an act of our will, not a feeling in our flesh. Now, we can love those who are unlovable and those with whom we have little in common, those who don't want or don't deserve our love because we decide to love, not because we feel like loving. That's the difference between philios and eros and storgos. All of those are based on our feelings and our relationship and things that we share. But agape love is based on, it's based on a decision, not a feeling. That idea of loving your enemy, right? Uh, that's agape your enemy. Yeah, that, that kind of love that we express to our enemy is based on a decision, a decision to obey God, not a feeling. Another point. Human love pleases man and is for man's pleasure. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm not knocking philios, eros, storgos, no. They have their place. 
they're the kind of love shared by, you know, by individuals, by human beings in, in various situations. Agape love, however, pleases both man and God because it injects God into every relationship, because it's from God. When we love as God loves, we become the channel through which God blesses other people. So if we're to succeed at marriage, and here's my point, if we're to succeed at marriage with ongoing love, we need to be expressing agape love, not simply eros love and philios love and storgios love. We have to add to those the element of agape love. So let's talk about agape love and marriage. Now I mentioned before that human love is not the source of love, merely the expression of love. And this experience, this agape, excuse me, this eros, storgios, philios, you know, that experience of love is fragile and it's temporary, being subject to age and illness and misunderstanding. And so when the reason for human love dies, so does that love. Again, when virility and beauty go, so does sex. When we hurt each other's feelings, our friendships die. When our children go, many marriages lose their joy. Godly love, however, agape love, because it is based on a conscious decision to offer our love to our partner without conditions for life, this is the oil that keeps the flame burning no matter how the situation changes. It's because we're ready to offer agape love that we say that we take our partner in sickness and in health for better or worse until death do us part. You see, only agape type of love can survive and support this promise. You can't promise Eros love for a lifetime. You can't promise Philios love for, you can't promise, story, you can't promise that for a lifetime, but you can promise agape love for a lifetime. And you can practice that for a lifetime. And it will nourish your relationship for a lifetime. So this kind of love is effective because it was this kind of love that drew all of us here to Christ in the first place. And it's the kind of love that keeps us faithful to Christ until the end. And my point is, if this kind of love exists in our relationships, in our marriage, it's the kind of love that will enable us to love one another until the end of our lives within marriage. Okay, so what does this, I've explained the nature of it a little bit and also the difference between agape love and these other kind of loves, but what does it look like? You know, I think that most people when they hear this, they say, well, I want some of that agape love. What does it look like in a practical setting? Describe it to me as a human being so you know, I can practice it and I can experience it. Well, the Apostle Paul describes the actions and reactions the personality and the character of agape love in 1 Corinthians 13, when he says, you know, love is patient, love is kind, so on and so forth. What he's saying is agape is patient, agape is kind. And you know, through the whole list of, of uh, emotions and actions that he describes there. So let's review these in this passage to understand what he's talking about. Agape, he says, is patient. He says agape is patient, meaning agape is willing to bear another's weakness without complaint or anger or discouragement. Agape love is able to do that, is willing to do that, wants to try to do that. Um, agape is kind. In other words, willing to serve with good acts. Agape, he says, is not proud. Meaning agape love is expressed in the sense that it doesn't overstate its own worth or consider itself better and worthy of honor more than the other person. Agape is not rude, meaning 
This kind of love acts politely, is considerate and honorable in its lifestyle, honest with its feelings. He says agape is not selfish, doesn't just consider uh, you know, self's own needs or desires. Agape is not sensitive, not easily offended, easily angered, doesn't become impatient over the slightest, uh, over the slightest thing. Agape is not vengeful, it doesn't keep score. You know, one of the things in marriage that uh, people complain about a lot is keeping score. You know, <laughs> You keep score, some, some little thing hurts you, some little offense. You know, couples don't talk about it, one or the other, or both partners, you know, they keep score, they keep keeping offenses in a little bag there, and, and all of a sudden one day, boom, it blows up, right? And all that stuff comes out. And if you've ever been on the receiving end of that, you realize, oh, well, I didn't know, why didn't you tell me? And it all comes out. And in other words, you know, the, the moment, the emotion that explodes at that moment isn't worth what just happened. Well, no, of course not. It's because somebody's been keeping score for a while and all of a sudden it's time to settle. And so Paul says, you know, agape love, it doesn't, it doesn't keep score. You know, in agape love, uh, uh, people you know, are not counting. Well, you know, I did the dishes Monday and Tuesday. You know, I did it two days in a row. It's your, it's your turn to do it two days in a row. You know, so, so we can keep a balance there. My, my wife and I, you know, when we're looking at, we each do chores around the house. Our attitude is always, well, if I see it and it needs to get done, I do it. And sometimes I'll have done something several times you know, in a row. I'll just have taken, taken care of it. You know, my wife says, well, you don't have to do that. You know, it's my turn. I should do it too. And I tell her, hey, nobody's counting. I'm not counting. I'm not keeping score. So keeping score isn't just like keeping score of the bad things you did to me so I can kind of get back at you. Keeping score is I'm not keeping score at who did the dishes how many times or who who took out the tray? You know, I'm not keeping score of that. that that's, that's agape love. Agape love uh, loves justice. It wants good to win. Good in your personal life, good for the other person, good in, in general. Agape forgives, ready to cover the other, the other person's mistakes, rather than point out the mistakes. You see your partner making a mistake or a thing and right away you got to point out all their faults all the time. Agape love works at covering the faults, loving over the fault, you know, not paving over, loving over the faults rather than pointing them out. Agape love is trusting, not blind trust or gullible trust, but you know, does not give in to every suspicion. Agape love gives the benefit of the doubt. Agape love always hopes. Always hopes what? Well, hopes that eventually the best will come out in the partner. I'm always hoping for the best for you that happens to you and that comes out of you. I'm always hoping for the best. And agape love is long suffering. You know, God's type of love is ready to endure a long time for the sake of the other person. This is part of the original decision, to love no matter what. You know, it, it's brief, in sickness or in health, in good times and bad. And of course, when we make that promise, I think we're sincere. It's just we don't think there'll be bad times, or we don't think there'll be more bad times than good times. Agape love is the kind of love, of course, that helps you to really celebrate the good times, but also helps you to endure the bad times as well. So when examining your relationship, examining your love, examining your marriage, don't list how often you feel good. Don't count how many times you've had sex in the last month. Don't review what you're doing together these days as a way of determining if your love is alive. We've had sex you know, six times this month. That must mean our love is alive. Well, not necessarily. 
Don't forget to also examine your love in light of 1 Corinthians 13 and see if it's agape love that you are cultivating. If you're not, these other things cannot be revived when they're gone. If it is, then these other things will flow naturally as a result. So how do we keep love alive in our marriages? Well, first of all, decide that from here on in, we're going to love our partner, not because of what they give us, but because this is what a child of God does. In other words, your love is given based on a decision, not based on a feeling. We love as a response to God's command. In 1 John 4, 16, uh, John writes, the one who abides in love abides in God. If we love based on a decision, then we're loving like God loves and we're obeying God's command concerning love. So how do we keep a love alive? Love your spouse as a response to God's command. If you do that, it gets you through the difficult times and really accentuates the good times. And secondly, Practice agape love. Begin to practice agape love in your marriage. God will strengthen us in patience and kindness and all these other virtues if we ask Him. I mean, that's, it's okay to pray, God, please you know, help me uh, succeed in my career or dear God, help me you know, raise these children properly. It, these are fine. Dear God, please bless our uh, intimate sexual life together. Bless that Lord that it be f fulfilling and, 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 and we can be happy in it and satisfied and you know that's a good prayer of course. Of course. But don't neglect also to ask God to help you you know develop patience and kindness and long-suffering and humility and uh, just, you know, these things, don't, don't be afraid to ask for these things as well because these are the things that are going to be able to keep those other things going throughout your, your marriage. You know, and also we can learn how to love. It's a learned experience. In Ephesians 3, uh, 20, you know, uh, Paul says, uh, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, God can, you know, can teach and develop and cultivate all those virtues uh, that are bound together in agape love. He can teach us that. He can help us with that. Remember, this type of love style must be cultivated because it goes against our natural desires and tendencies. And marriage is God's creation where we are placed in order to learn how to agape. You know those marriages, you see those elderly couples walking hand in hand, still affectionate with one another, happy to be together, having that kind of easy, smooth kind of style with one another. And you say, well, that's what I want. I, I, I want to be able to grow old with my partner and get to that wonderful kind of, you know, they just fit hand in glove type of relationship. Long after, you know, sexual desire has finally, you know, kind of the flame of that has kind of gone out. Folks are in their 80s and, you know, you, you, but you still see the love that they have for one another. I want that, you say. Well, if you want that, then you have to cultivate this. This is what gets you to that, okay? So God promises in His word that if you do this, your love will remain alive, not only for the life of your marriage, but will uh, stay alive forever. Remember, Paul says, love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. What do you think? What, what, what do you think? What word is there? Eros never fails? Phileos never fails? Storgios never fails? No. No, the word he uses, agape. Agape never fails. And so if you have agape love and you cultivate that in your marriage, then your marriage will never fail either. Okay, so that's the kind of capstone 
uh, lesson for this series. I want to thank everybody who's kind of stuck with it in this class, of course, and those who may be watching online or later on on the BibleTalk.tv website. We thank you for your attention. We pray that God bless you and God bless your marriages and God give you an abundance of agape love in these relationships.